Good evening. I'm Glenn Lowry, director of the Museum of Modern Art, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, which is sponsored by the Friends of Education here at the Museum of Modern Art, and I want to thank all of our friends for helping to make this possible. Tonight's conversation is held in conjunction with the exhibition One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series, and other visions of the Great Movement North here at the museum until September 7th and curated by our very own brilliant Leah Dickerman. It is a stirring exhibition with Lawrence's epic visual narrative at its heart. I hope you've had a chance to see it and that you'll come back again and again and again. Lawrence was, was a child of migrants. From the age of 13, he called Harlem his home. One thing I found striking about Lawrence's world, the world of the library and community centers and studios in which he spent time was that it was one in which artists, poets, musicians, and philosophers brushed shoulders with political activists and spoke together of the urgent issues of the day. There's a model there for us, a model in the synergies produced across fields and the role that culture plays in a truly civic society. Lawrence's work tells us, above all, that history matters that black history matters. He tells us that he makes works about Toussaint Louverture and Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and the Great Migration because these things mattered to him and to his community. They were the things that people spoke of on the streets. Black history mattered in Lawrence's circles and in Lawrence's moment because it was a way of taking control of the narrative, encountering other, more pernicious narratives. History is just as urgent today. Tonight's conversation is staged to explore the long history of Jacob Lawrence's concerns. With us this evening is really the A-team, the all-star team, a trio of leading voices fighting for social justice in our country. Khalil Muhammad is the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. He's become a friend of the museum in the course of this project, which was done in collaboration with the Schomburg Center. He has served on the exhibition's advisory committee. He's a leading scholar on issues of race and justice and a frequent commenter in the media. And I just want to say, Khalil, what a great honor it has been for us to get to know and to work with you. We have benefited enormously from your knowledge and insight. <laughs> Sherilyn Eiffel follows in the footsteps of the great Thurgood Marshall as the leader of the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP, the leading civil rights law firm in this country. And Sherilyn, thank you so much for making the time to share your knowledge with us. Anyone who saw her firm resolution, and boy indeed it was, last Monday night speaking with Andrea Mitchell on events in South Carolina knows she is more than up to the task. Sherilyn was among those who carried the voting rights case, Shelby County versus Holder, to the Supreme Court in 2013. Cornell Brooks is the newly installed head of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. He is a lawyer and equally importantly, a fourth generation minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, carrying the heritage and rhetorical eloquence of the tradition of the minister activists into the present day. It's a family tradition to quote, two of my great grandfathers fought on the side of the union he has said in an interview. They were sharecroppers involved in the rice strikes and struck to be paid in cash rather than scrip. And we are so grateful that you're with us, Cornell. It makes an enormous difference. I want to just take a moment to express 
our gratitude for your work on behalf of all of us who hold equal justice to be a central tenet of American society. I want to frame the questions for tonight's event. How do we understand the long history of Jacob Lawrence's concerns? How do we understand the relationship between Lawrence's Great Migration series and current events today? And how can we position our understanding and knowledge of these momentous and critical events to make our society a better place? Khalil, let me turn the proceedings over to you. Good evening, everyone. I have to get my clicker out. It's like um, being an old professor. I've got to be prepared here. I want to thank uh, all of the wonderful people here at MoMA. I want to thank uh, Glenn Lowry, especially, for his leadership in supporting uh, this amazing show. And I want to thank uh, one of my newest friends, Leah Dickerman, uh, for her creativity, for her expansiveness, uh, for her commitment to telling as rich and textured uh, a story and to present the work in the way that Jacob Lawrence imagined that that history has so many layers. Um, what she's done in terms of the outreach to uh, the African American community through so many thoughtful scholars and writers and artists, invisible to all of you for the most part, uh, but shows a commitment and a willingness um, to see work in as broad and as rich a context, to see art in as broad and a rich a context as possible. So thank you very much, Leah. Well, we have, uh, I often get confused as uh, an activist, so let me set the record straight in case uh, there are any people who confuse being an educator uh, with a passion for justice and people who actually dedicate themselves uh, to changing the world we live in as activists, as let, um, advocates, um, and those who motivate people as organizers. And so I am extremely honored to be here with Cheryl and Eiffel and with Cornell Brooks. I wanted to uh, first begin tonight's conversation by asking them uh, to distinguish their organizations. Um, I know for many of us, thinking about uh, the NAACP, uh, LDF, and the NAACP, uh, it doesn't immediately come easily to understand those differences. So just, just just tell us briefly uh, what the differences are in how you work separately and together. Well, we were, we were first of all, hello and thank you <laughs> for getting my manners. Thank you for, for having me tonight to be part of this uh, conversation. And I also am very grateful to Leah uh, and to MoMA for the presentation of this extraordinary exhibit and for evenings like tonight. Um, which give us an opportunity to really surround this extraordinary art with the context that I think uh, Lawrence was trying to bring to it. Um, and at a moment in our country when uh, we really need this art to help us understand our history, the present moment we're in, and to see a path forward. Um, and I couldn't be more pleased to, than to be here with these two extraordinary gentlemen. Uh, I, I tweeted before I came out that, you know, you, you can't find a better card than this in New York tonight. So I am. Uh, very excited to be flanked by these two, two gentlemen. Uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP were, of course, part of the same organization for uh, a very long time. The Legal Defense Fund, the organization I now lead, was led first by Thurgood Marshall, uh, who later became the first African-American Supreme Court Justice and was a brilliant civil rights lawyer uh, who learned his craft under the tutelage of the great Charles Hamilton Houston. Uh, and he um, ran the legal arm of the NAACP uh, for many years. The leader of the NAACP for much of that early tenure uh, when Marshall was leading the Legal Defense Fund was Walter White. Uh, and LDF, the Legal Defense Fund, really engaged in the litigation that you probably are quite familiar with, the litigation of Brown versus Board of Education, challenging segregation. All of the cases desegregating universities in the South, including you know, Old Miss and University of Alabama, uh, University of Georgia, all of the clashes with George Wallace, representing the Selma marchers, all of the, the law and the litigation 
uh, that really undergirded the civil rights movement. And of course, we were there before the civil rights movement as well. Um, but the organization separated more than 50 years ago um, and fully separated with separate boards and um, uh, entirely uh, separate staffs. And so I always say to people that, you know, we're cousins, uh, we're related, we're, you know, we're, we're in the same family, um, but we're two separate organizations. And our focus is really about law. It's about equal justice under law. So our organization is comprised largely of lawyers, um, but we also engage in policy work and research and advocacy work. And in fact, this year uh, is our 75th anniversary and we're launching, uh, applause, applause, <laughs> applause. And one of the things we're doing is launching something called the Thurgood Marshall Institute, which is a hub within the Legal Defense Fund of researchers and organizers and policy folks to kind of deepen and broaden our litigation work. But we actually work very closely with the NAACP, which remains the nation's oldest and premier civil rights organization. Uh, and we work and represent NAACP chapters throughout the South. Cornell and I are in, in great communication with one another, and we share many of the same aims. Um, and so it's actually a great relationship. So uh, good evening to uh, everyone here, and I want to um, echo Sherilyn's uh, sentiment of appreciation. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be a part of this conversation, and um, so inspired uh, by so many people who uh, are patrons of art, uh, but also advocacy and social justice. So the NAACP came into being, uh, was birthed uh, near the turn of the century in terms of 1909, in the wake of a horrific uh, race riot in the uh, home place of, of President Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois. And in the ashes and embers of this horrific uh, race riot, we came into being. Uh, the NAACP, over the course of 106 years, uh, has been on the forefront of the nation's civil rights challenges. Uh, we've engaged in advocacy, uh, litigation, uh, social science, scientific and public policy research. Uh, and in all of these endeavors, we have built uh, morally imaginative uh, coalitions of conscience, uh, taking on challenges from the death penalty to discrimination in housing and employment. And as Sherilyn has lifted up, we really work shoulder to shoulder uh, with our cousin. I would liken it more like siblings at this point. I'm good with that. Uh, <laughs> brother and sister organizations who engage in a common struggle uh, against injustice uh, in this country. Uh, we represent 2,100 uh, chapters or branches, units all across the country, hundreds of thousands of members. There's no place you can go in this country. You can get in a car and drive in any direction and you will come across a branch of the NAACP. In Alaska, you might have to drive a little longer, but generally speaking, you'll come across a branch of the NAACP. <laughs> so I, I wanted to start there because I think it's important uh, to understand the creativity in the protest tradition in and of itself. Uh, we often falsely separate um, cre the creative process, uh, which we easily recognize in, uh, in paintings, in the visual arts, in literature. But we often don't think about the creative work it takes uh, to do uh, social activism, to do justice work. And so listening both to the sketch of the organization's separate histories and also the range of activities engaged in uh, is both a reflection of the depth of those challenges as well as the creative strategies deployed. Um, I want to bring uh, Jacob Lawrence's uh, panels into the conversation now to set a frame for the content that he himself was uh, engaging and maybe talk a little bit about his own creative process and to span back out into the history that uh, he was in conversation with. So this is a selection of the 60 panels uh, uh, that are jointly owned by the Phillips Collection and, and MoMA. And these panels in particular do speak to the social content um, that Jacob Lawrence was deeply interested in and concerned about.
And so thinking about this work, thinking about the history that it tells, the sociology of the moment in which Jacob Lawrence is wrestling with issues of education, of housing, of segregation, of labor, of voting, of racial violence and criminal justice. How do you understand the relationship of art and politics as organizations? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the things I think many of us fail to realize is the very strong relationship that it existed between art and civil rights work. And I think uh, in the introduction, Glenn was describing um, how you know everything that was unfolding in real time was captured and used by artists, not just by Lawrence, but by writers like Langston Hughes and by um, vocalists and others. It was really a, a means of expression. And it was an important means of expression in part because the conditions were so stark, because it was so difficult to express what was happening around things like lynching or what was happening in the courts. And so artists played um, a central role. I continue to believe that art remains important as a form of expression, as a way of not only um, documenting what is happening, but also kind of calling back from the community to those of us who do activist work to understand what's happening. So when I see, and I'm actually quite gratified to see many of the hip hop artists, organic hip hop artists, not the superstars, who are <laughs> grappling with um, how to express what's happening in Ferguson, how to talk about uh, their own condition and their own um, views about the world which in some ways differ from the, you know, the views of kind of the mainstream adult, um, you know, kind of civil rights class. Um, this is very powerful and this is not new. This is kind of the, the role that art has always played uh, in the movement. And I think it's only because as we have moved into a um, more integrated setting in terms, of, in terms of art, people have forgotten the fact that this connection still happens. But if you're being conscious, if you're in fact listening, if you're in fact watching, if you're looking at the photographs of you know, Hank Willis, if you're, you know, if you're really paying attention, you're seeing that this relationship remains. Uh, and it should be, for those of us who are involved in activism, it should be speaking to us. It should be uh, asking us to think about the connections. I think that you were beginning to talk about. Every Lawrence frame shows this, it shows you know, the first frame you showed was the one in the courtroom mm -hmm. with the, you know, the white judge looking down and, the, and, the, and, and that obviously that one speaks especially to, to, to me as the head of the Legal Defense Fund because we're lawyers. Um, and that's the world that Thurgood Marshall was dealing with and it's the world that we deal with. But what's happening in that room? I mean, the brilliance of Lawrence is that in a, in a frame there'll be three figures, a table, a desk, a pot. Uh, it, it will look very spare. But in that room are all of these elements and pieces that bring together um, the full range, the full 360 that describes the condition in which African Americans were living. So to view a frame is to provoke you to begin to think about a whole set of issues, not just, you know, if you're looking at the first frame, what's the case about and are they going to get justice? But who is this judge and how did this judge get there? And can you tell from the frame that the judge is not really aware of these individuals as real people? Can you see the difference in size between them? Can you see the difference in status between them? Can you see the huddling together of you know, the, the, the litigant and their attorney? I mean, it's speaking to all of these different pieces that you as a civil rights uh, activist or litigator have to be responsive to, not just to the name of the case and the particular issue that happened. And so that's what art is, is so, why our art is so powerful in helping us express the work of the movement. And so you, uh, so the ways in which um, social justice advocates uh, emulate artists, uh, and there are also ways in which we are inspired by artists. So when we think about the panels 
uh, particularly uh, in terms of lynching. Uh, the work is both narrative and evocative. It suggests a story and a, 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 a storyline of tragedy, if you will, in terms of lynching. So when we think about the fact that 10 years after the founding of the NAACP, uh, we had 90 lynchings uh, in a single year, once every four days. So uh, the, the panels uh, narrate, depict, but they also invoke in terms of calling out to the viewer uh, to feel, to empathize. In some ways, the work of the advocate is like that. So the NAACP, when we were founded, we first issued a report, uh, 30 years of lynching in the, in the United States. But going beyond that, when you... So uh, uh, sure. I'm missing an opportunity here to put some of what Cornell is talking about. So keep talking. I'm just going to call the attention to the audience um, because this is a good moment to bring into actual presentation of some of what Cornell is actually describing here. So where is the... I didn't really want to interrupt you. There you are. Yeah. So this is exactly the, the, the picture I was thinking about, which, which uh, there's a reprint in my office. The ways in which advocates uh, emulate art in the sense that we narrate, we tell a story through this report on lynching, but we also s seek to evoke a response uh, in uh, participants in this democracy. So when you hang a flag outside of your headquarters saying a man was lynched today, you're not only telling a story, you're not only stating facts, you're also trying to elicit uh, a, a democratic response, a moral response. And so uh, when you think about uh, the picture of co-eds at Howard University with, who are dressed in an elegant uh, attire, who look like the, the, you know, the models of, of young scholars to be, but with lynch ropes around their necks. They're not merely making a statement about this form of racialized violence. They're also saying, do something about it. And we are like you. We represent the same values that, that you represent. We represent your future. But feel what we feel. Be moved by what we moved. Uh, so there's, there's a strong relationship between can art and advocacy. Comment, can I add, comment on that? Because you, you raised the lynching issue, and this is a this is a kind of a, a sore subject for me because I think it, it also raises the way in which art can respond and, de and demand. I mean, the, if you look at, at, at Jacob Lawrence's depictions of you know, the people leaving because of lynching, right? You know, we've got to leave this place. Or you look at the photograph that Cornell's talking about of a man was lynched today and you compare it to what was actually happening um, you know, in communities where lynchings were happening. So I wrote a book about um, lynching in 2007 called On the Courthouse Lawn Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century. And here's what was happening. What was happening is the people who were engaged in lynching, the people who were um, committing these terrible acts, who were participating, who were engaged in the carnival-like atmosphere, were also engaged in a form of art. They were taking pictures of lynched bodies and they were selling them and turning them into postcards and sending them around, and they were gathering body parts and putting them in jars and saving them and preserving hair and so forth. And some of you may have seen the um, exhibit of lynching photographs called Witness a few years ago. Without um, sanctuary. Without sanctuary. And so, and so that was happening. Now contrast that with what, with what Lawrence is showing, which is the move, what was happening to real people. Because what those folks were engaged in was a kind of pornography is one of the reasons why, um, even on the cover of my book, I covered the lynching victim's body with words, because, because I do believe that um, it, this is a man mm -hmm. at, who is entitled to dignity and respect. So what, what Lawrence is doing is he's turning it into a story, a narrative about the community, and he's showing it for what it is. Lynching was a, was a crime of terrorism against the community. It wasn't just about the individual. So when he does what he does with lynching in his art, he is putting it in the proper frame and context, which is a response to the kind of pornographic engagement that the white community was engaged in um, around lynching. So it's a, it's a, you know, I think it's very powerful and very subversive uh, what he does with lynching. It's not just that he's saying this happened, but he's saying this is the meaning of this thing that happened. I, um I want to talk about lynching a, a little bit longer because it just so happens that Brian Stevenson has an organization that focuses on indigent defense uh, for mostly 
uh, death row inmates. Uh, it's called the Equal Justice Institute. It's in Alabama. Brian Stevenson is a, is a lawyer and has been doing this work now for at least 20, 25 years. Uh, he's committed himself and his organization uh, to documenting sites of lynching around the country uh, after having issued a report called Lynching in America, uh, The Legacy of Racial Terror. And it would strike many people as completely contradictory uh, to the political achievements of this age that here in 2015 would there be the need to actually come to terms with this legacy. And so part of what I want to think through is, is Jacob Lawrence just like these young people expressing the requirement of dealing with a social crisis of racial terror that already two generations of black people had already had to deal with. In the same way that we might think, how sad is it that in 2015, 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, that we'd be producing a report, that someone would have to spend the time and resources to pre pre prepare a report on lynching in America. So I, I, I just want to play with time a little bit. Well, so I want, to, I want to challenge the premise a little bit. Okay. Because um, lynching is actually distinct in that it was surrounded by silence. And the reason that silence has to be broken is because it is so connected to events of today. When, when I was writing this book, the reason I wrote it is because I was a civil rights lawyer, first at the Legal Defense Fund as a young lawyer, and then in Maryland, and I did mostly voting rights work, and I would go into communities, and I was working on a highway siting case, an environmental justice case. And when I was in a community and I asked about the history of discrimination, people in the community would always tell me about some act of violence that happened. Uh, when I was in Maryland, they told me about the last two recorded lynchings in Maryland. It happened in 1931 and 1933 in the town where I was bringing the civil rights case. But it had never been discussed. It wasn't in the newspaper. It's kind of like the Tulsa race riots where the edition of the Tulsa world was missing, you know, from the library. It was shrouded in this secrecy. Black people said you had to be quiet because they feared the, the terror and the pogroms that followed lynching. White people engaged in their own silence to um, close ranks and protect their community. So in fact, when I entered that community in 1998 to begin my civil rights case, the lynchings that happened in 1931 and 1933 had never been discussed. They had never been documented. There had never been any conversation about them except in very private settings. And so I would say it is actually not surprising that we have to <laughs> mine this history because it was deliberately covered and yet the communities where the, these events happen are shaped forever. So I'm always asking, how do we know the history of a community when we just walk in and we look at it? Why do black people live on this side of the tracks and not on that side of the tracks? How did all these black people get to Chicago, which is what Lawrence is interrogating, what Isabel Wilkerson's talking about in The Warmth of Other Suns? How did the physical landscape that we've all come to accept that is racialized, how did it happen? And we have to interrogate that. But, but, I mean, the, but the, this code of silence um, is multi-generational. Right? So to the extent that there was a, a code of silence around lynching uh, for much of our history and when we think about what has happened uh, in recent days, uh, literally in the, in the pages of our newspapers and on, on news sites, uh, there's still a code of si silence. Uh, it's broken, it is disrupted by videotape, um, by bystanders with their cell phones. So when we think about what's happened in, in Ferguson, uh, in, in many ways, you have young people taking uh, cell phones and digital technology and reducing a complex, mm -hmm. violent narrative mm -hmm. to some very simple elements. Jacob Lawrence take his, takes primary colors, stark images, uh, geometric shapes, and produces an a, a elementalist, if you will, moral narrative. Same thing. But it, it, it's a way of arousing uh, the conscience of people and getting people to think about the moral essentials, that this is in fact an outrage. Um, but in, in either instance, uh, if he did not do what he did, if these young people did not do what they are in fact doing, we would not be paying attention. Yeah. That's exactly, I, I mean, mm -hmm. two, two really great uh, responses, because I think that's exactly what the tension is between 
Lawrence looking back a generation to his parents' generation and seeing the source of the push, uh, the violence, that, uh, that, that spark of we are no longer going to live under these conditions as a 20-something at the same time that these 20-somethings are. So that co connection between art and politics around the same racial justice crisis is exactly the generational tension. These young people, like Lawrence himself, are wrestling with maybe the work isn't finished here. Because I think one of the things we lose in the, in, in the translation of the Great Migration series is that as much as it is sociological in, in unpacking themes that continue to resonate in the North as he talks about what it means to be in the North, it is also looking back. He's explaining how we got here. And that relationship to that past and present, I think, uh, is a tense one. In the same way that we are intensely concerned about the fact that we need to still wrestle with this, this past around racial violence, particularly as it plays out in exactly the terms you've just described. But isn't it also um, aspirational, right? So to the extent that uh, Jacob Lawrence is talking about this mass movement, this really is, is Isabel Wilkerson said a, a flight, if you will, from, from violence, from Jim Crow. Uh, it's less a matter of migration than people being evicted, if you will, uh, by brutal circumstances in the Deep South. Um, but it's also uh, a migration of aspiration. This is what the people are fleeing from. This is what they're moving toward. Uh, that's both geographic, but it's also moral. In other words, the, the courts do not treat us as citizens uh, in our own country. Uh, what then do we do? What then do we aspire to? In a sense, that's what in, is in fact happening now. Because when, when young people are, are video, videotaping or are capturing uh, with images something that they deem to be horrific and unacceptable and unconscionable, they are also saying, we believe other things are of conscience and moral and right. We choose not this, we choose that. Yeah. There's a, a wonderful quote that is featured in the show. It's, um, it is one of the books that, uh, that we know Lawrence read and used as a kind of uh, source material for understanding the migration. Uh, the book is by Emmett Scott, who was a secretary um, in the War Department, as well as um, someone who worked with Booker T. Washington. Uh, so in this quote, um, we, we get a little bit of, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. We get a little bit of a kind of historical echo. And so I'll give everyone a chance uh, to read it. Cheryl and I see you. <laughs> so. Where do you want to begin? Well, where to begin? Um, well, let me just start by saying that um, the relationship of African Americans to the criminal justice system and the construction of the model, modern criminal justice system um, has rarely been understood as an, as, e as an economic system. It is, it is mostly been seen as a social system, as a system of, you know, a penal system, but it has not been understood um, as an economic system, and it's not been understood as an economic system that is deeply embedded in the fabric of American economic history. Whether we're talking about, um, you know, convict labor uh, after the end of, of slavery and, and well into the 20th century, uh, whether we're talking about the conditions that are described here, whether we're talking about um, St. Louis County and uh, the use of, you know, traffic fines and court costs to basically fund governments that otherwise really could not exist but for this elaborate criminal shakedown uh, of the African American population. Um, and, and what's fascinating about it and, and, and uh, dis depressing about it uh, is that this is one of the silences, this is one of the secrets that those who live under these regimes have long known about and have talked about. The exposure of a Ferguson's system, whereby traffic fines and court fees 
uh, with never-ending um, additions to those court fees and bench warrants issued if you can't pay and thus in inveigling otherwise innocent people in the criminal justice system who go to jail simply because they're too poor to pay these, these court costs for traffic violations. These are conditions that were well known and are well known to people living in St. Louis County. And the report that the organization Art City Def Defenders created was created long before Mike Brown was killed. And so this information had also been collected, made public on their website, very well known. It is now receiving attention because it has received the imprimatur of the Department of Justice who has in, who have in, who's investigated uh, what is happening in Ferguson and found that the um, community and the, and the uh, court system is part, along with the police department, of a, of a pattern and practice of discrimination. So once again, you have something that is open in plain sight, which is very much like when I talked about lynching, I named my book On the Courthouse Lawn because I wanted to suggest that it wasn't a secret. It wasn't something that happened in the woods. It was in the center of town and you know, 2,000 people attended. So part of what we have to um, wrestle with mm -hmm. is, the, is the way in which we have chosen to be observers of conditions that exist in plain sight and have for some time. Um, and so what's described in this, in this quotation has been an ongoing means of controlling the population, of creating its own government, of creating jobs, of maintaining uh, a certain kind of economic, economic ecosystem, um, largely for white power structures in communities throughout the South. The question now that we see it is what then will we do about it? Will we pretend that we don't see it? Will we tinker with it around the edges? Or will we pull the thread and decide that we can see what it actually shows us? And what it actually shows us, and I'll stop because then I'll really get into this, is, is that in many communities around this country, and particularly, um, I think Ferguson is a great example, but throughout St. Louis County and other places as well, there is um, a broken system of government that is in fact not democratic, in fact is not representative, is created solely for the purpose of sustaining itself, not serving the population. And so in a town like Ferguson, you can have a part-time mayor who gets a stipend of $350 a month, a part-time city council that gets a stipend of $250 a month, a court system that keeps itself going, run by a town manager who really controls the town, an unelected person, uh, and a police chief. So the people who run the town are unelected. The elected people are kind of the show and the economic system is not one that's created by um, you know, civil servants and, and uh, leaders who sit down in a room and figure out the future of the town. It's created by this system. It's maintained by this system. And that is a democracy problem that we all should be concerned about because that is how people are living in communities all over the country, particularly in these working class suburbs that were created not to serve a population with urban needs that needs you know, economic infrastructure and jobs and so forth, but to serve largely a population that was fleeing integration, moving to the suburbs, and wanted weak government. And when that was the population who lived there, maybe that was okay. But that's not the population that lives there anymore. And so we have a profoundly undemocratic system that this is a part of, and that's maintained by this kind of apparatus. I, I want to ask um, Cornell if this history lesson, this lesson, this was a lesson to Lawrence. Let's keep that in mind. <laughs> Lawrence is reading a book that's already 20 years old when he's actually painting the series. So my question to you is, on the ground, in community after community, you said you can't travel more than a few miles without running into an NAACP branch. Do people know this history? I'm not sure if people know um, this history as in this work. I don't mean this work. I mean, do they understand how thin the line is between the past and the present in the very kinds of communities where, you, where the national organization is represented with the very kinds of anti-democratic policies that Sherilyn just described. Absolutely. So think about it this way. The, the, the 
challenge that Jacob Lawrence was responding, responding to artistically and in terms of the scholarship that he was exposed to in the last century. Think about this century. Two books, Douglas Blackman's Slavery by Another Name, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, describing a period of penal servitude, in the case of Douglas Blackman, uh, an era of mass incarceration, in the case of Michelle Alexander. When I travel the country and talk to people, they talk about this criminal justice system as really a criminal justice system that is profoundly rooted in the free market with the assumption that some people should not be free. That's a reality. So when we think about the fact that you have 2.3 million Americans behind bars, one out of every four adults with a criminal record, 65 million Americans. One out of every three young people being arrested by the age of 23. A architecture of exclusion in this country that means that if you have a criminal record, your ability to work, to be a taxpayer, to take care of your family is profoundly impeded. As one Supreme Court justice put it, it's like getting a life sentence of unemployment. Mm -hmm. The people get that. Even though they may not be steeped in the scholarship, of Jacob, Jacob Lawrence's scholarship, a contemporary scholarship, but they understand it. Last point here. When a young person from Ferguson said to me, uh, well before the Department of Justice report came out, that there's something wrong about the fact that one of her neighbors left home during the summer, went away on vacation, came back after a number of rainstorms. The grass in her front yard was pretty high. They were issued a ticket because they didn't pay the fine, they were subse subsequently issued uh, uh, subject to arrest. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you, one does not need to be a legal scholar to understand that that is profoundly wrong. The point being here is the people get this, and I'll add one point to Sherilyn's. The, the difference between what happened in the early part of the last century and now, the size and scope of this problem reaches well beyond black and brown communities. We have criminalized our republic, and not just black and brown people. That's uh, much more dystopic than, um, <laughs> I thought it was just black and brown people. Um, so I, I, wanna, I wanna push back a little bit, because I know that um, we wanna both give agency to people mm -hmm. who experience these realities and you've described an organization that raised the red flag long before the Department of Justice did and, and Cornell, you're talking about the literacy mm -hmm. of your membership and not, not only matching their experience with information, but something did go amiss between the far-reaching consciousness of the civil rights decades, and let's pitch them starting in the 1940s when Lawrence was working. And, and Leah writes beautifully um, in the curatorial essay called Fighting Blues about a popular front that is mobilized for social justice, about a government that is accommodating a left that is very powerful and mass-based and is moving and shaking. Uh, that it's in that context where the March on Washington movement is born, uh, uh, a slide here depicting the March on Washington movement, uh, which is the, the threat uh, to embarrass uh, the federal government, to embarrass FDR before a world stage um, in the midst of uh, fascist Germany. So you have the burgeonings of a mass social movement that will increase speed from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s. And then something happens. And I'm not sure what year that is. I'm not sure which of the causes, but, but a politics of personal responsibility begin to emerge. So whether or not people are themselves able to diagnose the fleecing that is happening in the criminal justice system, whether or not they fully understand that when you are uh, convicted to a felony, you are literally disappeared from civil society, seems that a lot of people start blaming themselves, blaming their children, blaming the community. Now is that just media spin? Or if we were measuring consciousness from the 40s in a moment like this, in the 50s, in the 60s, 
something in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Something changed in terms of consciousness. And, I, and the only pushback here is not that you aren't right when Douglas Blackman's book was published in 2009 or Sherilyn's book published in 2007, but give me something from the 1980s in the midst of the war on drugs. I got you. I got you. All right. I got Thank you. you. So, <laughs> so in this very room, I had the great honor and privilege of screening the film um, about the Black Panthers, Stanley Nelson's new film, which is extraordinary. Uh, and I, I, you know, I think we, we, we sometimes we hop around too much and we, we have to remember um, two things. One, um, whether it's the 40s, the 50s, or even the 60s and the civil rights movement. You know, sometimes the civil rights movement is almost like the anti-apartheid movement. Everybody apparently was a part of it. Um, <laughs> but in fact, everyone was not, not even all black people. Um, so we're talking about a slice of the community that led and, and sacrificed tremendously, but it was not everyone, and not necessarily even a majority. I'm not saying people didn't do their part in their own way, but I, you're talking about the kind of mass movement folks. So that's first of all. Second of all, um, the pushback against the um, more radical element of that movement in the 70s, um, certainly depicted in the Black Panther movie, but I think well known to many of us who study history, we should not minimize the effect of that backlash, especially on young people. Mm -hmm. This country came so violently and so cruelly um, against young people. By the way, not just black young people. You know, the, the, the shootings at Kent State, the, these, are, these are psychological moments in this country that we sometimes gloss over. It's like, oh, the 70s. No, these were actually formational moments that at the very time we were going to the moon, we were allowing the killing of our own kids, uh, and there was this violent response to the kind of more militant um, uh, efforts of the movement. So I think that created a certain kind of culture, a certain kind of fear. The last thing I'll say is we sometimes forget, as African Americans, the second part of that, which is that we are Americans. And what that means is that we are often subject to many of the um, eddies and streams that are affecting the larger culture. And so we were here in the 80s too. The 80s was the me generation and Ronald Reagan and all that stuff. And um, there was a kind of culture that many people kind of got on the bandwagon with. And the idea of that culture was very materialistic, very narrow, very much exalting capitalism. And it carried this personal responsibility and everybody can make it and be a millionaire. And we were not immune from that. We were not immune from that. So the idea that we somehow kind of skip from, you know, the civil rights movement and then we just, you know, where we were just great and we were all on the front lines and, you know, and, and speaking truth to power and then suddenly, you know, we arrived here and we were, we were slackers is kind of, is kind of less of, of the way it really went is that we are responding to the response to us and we are also living in the ecosystem that is the U.S. and we are absorbing um, it until until, as always, just as it was true in the 60s, we are called back, usually by moments of terrible violence, and very often by young people, to say, wake up, that what you have accommodated yourself to is intolerable. And that is the way movements go. And as I share with my staff, our job is to catch the wave. You know, we're on a wave right now, and you, progress is not, it doesn't just kind of steadily go forward in the civil rights. You know, there are just moments where you're just kind of, there, but you got to catch that wave. The, the, the way you've described this gives an entirely different read to this, this panel. And I'll, I'll let it sit there for a minute. Cornell, you were going to say. The migrants kept coming. When I, when I think about this panel, I, I, I think about these uh, arcs in American history. So as, as Sherilyn has said, that um, we take moments, uh, we take steps forward, and we as a country take steps backward. Um, but as Dr. King made two observations, one, uh, he saw history in Hegelian terms, a dialectic. Um, but he also noted that the arc of the moral universe was long, but it bends toward justice. The point being here is when we look at American history, there are moments when we, there are moments when we um, 
uh, have made tremendous uh, strides forward and then step backwards. So if we look at uh, the, the uh, first reconstruction uh, in terms of the 1860s, 1870s, uh, this uh, break, if you will, on the horizon, uh, a, a dawn of possibility and hope, uh, African Americans being elected across uh, the South, educational possibilities, public education, expanding some, some uh, loosening of the reins with respect to women uh, and their rights. Uh, and then we wake up in the 1950s, 1960s again. Uh, but the point being here is there are some in this country who've argued that we are on the, on the precipice, if you will, of a third reconstruction. That there's a, there's a moment here that we could seize it, we could stride forward, we can make tremendous progress, or we can succumb to the forces of re reaction and regression. But at those moments, there's always a juxtaposition, if you will, between tragedy and hope. Uh, things that we can't tolerate, that we can't wrap our conscience around, and the sense that things can be done differently if we choose uh, to seize those possibilities. Doesn't that so perfectly capture this last panel in the migration series? Because it's not clear, right? The only thing we know is that people will move. So through all that he narrated from that past, looking backwards, to his presence, where he is wrestling with the realities of this, where he's wrestling with this, he is still thinking that in the midst of tragedy, there is hope. It's very, it's, it's very ministerial vision, Cornell. Very AME. Very, <laughs> very, very, very. <laughs> Very, very rooted in, 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 in a I'm social sure context that is informed. We'll claim it. That, that is informed. Well, you know, everybody's got a little bit of AME, AME. right? Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that is part of the story. Um, we can't leave this moment, uh, and index cards are floating uh, through the audience, but we have to talk about Scottsboro. And we have to talk about Scottsboro because Scottsboro looms large in uh, both the exhibition uh, but also in the consciousness of the period. Uh, and so this is where uh, both we know that in your world, the, the, the legal infrastructure that we live with today is partly a response to some of the due process revolution that happened, that, that, that Scottsboro is part of a long tail, and you can give us kind of the highlights. Um, and at the same time, it's not the best chapter in NAACP's history either. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Scottsboro. And the reason, partly, is because the exhibition really does capture the influence of Scottsboro. I'll show a couple of, um, and we'll come back to some of these, kind of moving around. Here's one. So this is Langston Hughes, who wrote four poems, published them in 1932, and then visited uh, the young men in Alabama uh, and read them uh, this poetry. Uh, so thinking about that relationship between the artist uh, and the social crises of the moment. Uh, here is, uh, uh, well, that, there's one more, but <laughs> in any case, you get the point. Uh, so Scottsboro, tell us, so nine young men uh, literally accused of raping two white women on a railroad car in a small town in Alabama. Uh, they are essentially about to be uh, sentenced um, in very short order. Uh, except that they do get defense. And it's not the NAACP, no, it's not. but it's the International Labor Defense. Mm -hmm. So pick up the story. So that's, it's really fascinating. So um, the NAACP, and at this time we're part of the same organization, right. is slow on the take. They're nervous about the Scottsboro case. So the two th strands um, that I think are important, and, and what becomes interesting is the response of uh, the NAACP and, and Thurgood Marshall and others um, in response to their own slowness on Scottsboro, which is kind of interesting. So International Labor Defense is a, a communist-affiliated organization who come in and defend the young men. Um, and it reveals two strands that are happening at the per in the, during the period. One is the politics of respectability. The idea that, um, you know, the, there was a real hesitance about taking on cases with parties who were less than perfect. The idea that if we show, you know, if you look at all of the cases, you know, involving desegregating universities, there was always the search for the perfect plaintiff. You know, the first case that Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston win, civil rights case they win, is challenging segregation at University of Maryland Law School, and they win the case in 1935 in Baltimore. The search for the plaintiff, 
Donald Murray, you know, took a while because he had to be just so in order to, for them to believe they could present the case and win the case. And so Donald Murray is an Amherst grad, and, and uh, Charles Hamilton Houston went to Amherst. He's incredibly good looking. He has, you'll see him, he's got fantastic suits. He comes from a good family in Baltimore. I mean, there's a, there's a search for this perfect. So there, there are always these cases. Now, it's interesting because you know, many of the cases that uh, Charles Hamilton Houston was involved in, that Marshall was involved in, involved people who were accused of horrific crimes in the South, absolutely. But there was always a concern about taking on cases, and especially where interracial rape was the charge of, you know, taking on a case in which, well, you know, who knows how it's going to turn out, and this may not be the best case to kind of present all of the issues that we want. So they're slow on the take. So that's one strand. Second strand is fear of communism and fear of being affiliated with communist-affiliated organizations, which ran very strong through the NAACP and was certainly one of Thurgood Marshall's kind of um, enduring um, um, concerns, uh, because they really believed that would bring, ultimately bring the federal government so hard against them that it would destroy the organization, and that if they even gave the idea of being communist-affiliated during this period, it would be a death knell. And, and Al, just to make a mm -hmm. point on this, Alabama was uh, kind of a hotbed of uh, CPUSA, Communist Party USA, organizing because they had, according to Robin Kelly, the, the historian, had really made significant headways with black sharecroppers around tenant rights and labor rights, et cetera. And so. there had been a, a, a tremendous organization of, of black sharecroppers in Alabama and Arkansas who were beginning to rise up. So there, were, there was real concern about this. There was also this idea of African Americans needing to seem very patriotic, that that was very, very much an important part of the narrative that was being presented about um, equality. So all of those things came into play, so they were late. And ILD began the litigation, and the NAACP came in afterwards, after they were shamed, basically, by being so late. And as a result of that, um, Khalid, they were so embarrassed that it's one of the reasons why they were all over those two lynchings that I referred to, the 1931 lynching of Matthew Williams, which uh, took place in Maryland, which you know Thurgood Marshall was from Maryland, and then the 1933 lynching two years later of George Armwood. The picture you saw with the people with the nooses around the neck, that is, uh, they, are, they are in D.C. trying to get the Costigan-Wagner anti-lynching bill passed in 1934, and they're at a hearing. So this period from 1931 to 34 really becomes a period of tremendous activism within the NAACP around the lynching issue, and it's largely in response to their own embarrassment about their slow take on the Scottsboro Boys and their recognition that they had kind of missed something that captured the imagination of the country. It would be as though we had decided that like, I don't know about Ferguson, let me sit this one out, right? right? And, and um, it would, you know, it, so it was at that level. Yeah. And, and much of the um, incredible vigor that you see of the organization in this period around lynching really comes because they're like, we're not gonna be caught flat-footed again after we kind of embarrassed ourselves with the Scottsboro Boys. You know, just one, one thing I'll note is that there's always a tension between um, leaders and followers who lead. Namely, the rank and file membership got it. And so in terms of the politics uh, and, and, and advocacy of res respectability, when you're bringing the case, you look for the perfect victim. When you live in the neighborhood of victims, you don't necessarily think about the perfect victim. You simply want the victim represented. And so, I, I, I mean, you see that not just um, in this instance, but even today. I mean, you saw it in terms of the Mon Montgomery boycott. Um, Rosa Parks, secretary of the NAACP, someone with impeccable character. Uh, we see it today in terms of how Michael Brown was viewed versus Tamir Rice. Can I, um, so on, on this topic of Scott's book, because I think it's fascinating. I, I find myself in increasingly saying uh, publicly, uh, whether it's the media or just, um, uh, to, to individuals that the fight over the criminal justice system right now is unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And I say that partly because I feel like the Scottsboro moment is a telling moment for a road not taken. That it really is, it, not so much because we know as late as 1976, Supreme Court decisions are still coming down that essentially establish 
a set of due process rights that had only been constitutionally mandated but had never been tested and proven. So the all-white jury comes down uh, or falls because of the Scottsboro case. Indigent defense is established. All these cases, am I, do I have my civil rights? Well, all right, did, we got okay. a lawyer here, so <laughs> we won't, some of that, okay. right? Yeah, no, look, so, I just want to say that the, Scott, the, the Scottsboro case, the Powell case does end up establishing right. some really, in, you know, that the, the NAACP does get involved and it does establish that this, this, the verdicts could not stand because of, you know, kind of the mob environment, which proved to be a critically important ruling from the Supreme Court that affected so many of the cases that um, the NAACP and the LDF litigated thereafter, that there are conditions in which the court is willing to recognize the unfairness, that a jury could not possibly be partial in a climate in which everyone is clamoring for the life of a black man. That was huge and important. So that did happen. So, I mean, that, so in some ways, the Scottsboro case is the beginning of that process. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Back that's, to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. So there's Norris, there's mm -hmm, Powell. Mm -hmm. Okay. The point I want to make, though, is that the respectability problem mm -hmm. um, never goes away. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes the Achilles heel, in some ways, of the civil rights. Taking NAACP mm -hmm. and the legal cases mm -hmm. out of the conversation mm -hmm. becomes the Achilles heel of the movement. Because at some point, once there is a backlash to the civil rights movement after mm -hmm. 1968 with the election of President Nixon, there's no infrastructure that says even criminals deserve our attention. So if you take Michelle Alexander, the premise of her work, she opens the book in a, in a prologue saying, even I did not believe that there was a system that so specifically targeted black people that I couldn't take seriously the kind of activist voice that said the system is corrupt in this moment where she's practicing civil rights law around affirmative action. I want to see the Scottsboro moment as, as a history lesson, the one, one that, that Lawrence is in himself in conversation with, that Langston Hughes is in conversation with. There's so many people in that moment in conversation with that essentially means that part of what we have to, to reconcile is that we've we, those of us fighting for justice, have always been uncomfortable with, with that respectability space. I, I, the, right, reason why, the, the reason why I'm pushing back against it is because, is because I mean, I, I think about all of the death penalty work that we do and have done. I think about McCleskey versus Kemp when we come to the Supreme Court in 1986 and we bring all of the evidence that the death penalty in Georgia has racial underpinnings, is racist, is we, we bring all of the stuff, we do the baldest studies, 254 pages, and the Supreme Court says, and we don't think that's really important. Who are we representing? We're, right now, we represent a man named Dwayne Buck. We rep represent not, Dwayne. Wait, 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 wait. You. wait, wait, wait. I'm, saying, I'm so, not saying. No, but, I'm going to tell you about the about okay. what surrounds right. him, right? right? So, so this is a case in Harris County, Texas, which is the death capital of the world. So, if you're doing this work, you're doing it in a context in which for Dwayne Buck is not innocent. He admits it. He killed the people. The reason that we represent him is because his sentence, his death sentence, was given in the context in which the prosecutor essentially said that he is more likely to be dangerous in the future, which is what you have to prove in order to get the death penalty, because he's black. So all of the work around that case in, in, in Harris County, which it call, involves the faith community, by the way, of all races, um, involves people on the ground, grassroots and all that stuff, is for this man who is saying, I killed the people. But we are saying no matter who you are, when racism infects the justice system, it is a stain on our democracy, it affects you and me. And so what I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that respectability politics doesn't exist. It's one of the reasons why after the Mike Brown killing, um, people were saying he was a gentle giant, he was an angel, and you know what? Maybe he was a gentle giant, maybe he was an angel. But I was saying at the time, that is not necessary. You do not need to prove. So, so, so I think there is, you're right that there's an impulse there is an impulse to say, you know, this person was perfect. But actually, that's not what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is people are saying, so, you know, people are pushing back against why did he run in the case of Walter Scott. People are pushing back against the idea that you have to prove that the victim is perfect. And I find this very encouraging. I think it's a strand that exists, but I don't think people are buying it at this point. Yeah, I was about to say, people are ambivalent, right? They, if given the choice between a perfect victim 
and an imperfect victim, they prefer the perfect victim. But that doesn't mean that they won't advocate on behalf of people who are, who are routinely victimized. And so when you think about Ferguson, the Department of Justice report that was issued with all of this great statistical evidence, that came about as a consequence of the NAACP writing the law requiring the statistics before Michael Brown was killed. There were five, there were five complaints filed against uh, municipalities in St. Louis County before Michael, Michael Brown was killed. So the very people who were ambivalent about the videotape showing Mike, Mike Brown uh, uh, appearing to rough, to rough up a, a, a shopkeeper were the same people saying all young people deserve to be treated fairly. So yes, is there the ambivalence uh, in communities across the country? And if you look in the 70s and look at the fear of crime, the Rockefeller laws. So I mean, in this country, there is, there's, there's been this, this push for tougher sentencing, for a, a criminal justice system that will mete out uh, punishment and protect us from violence. But there's also been this push on the death penalty. We've seen a in the wake of that, a push to equalize sentences in terms of crack cocaine and powder cocaine, the NAACP on the forefront of that. So are, there, so are our advocates uh, without ambivalence? No. But do they continue to do advocacy on behalf of people who are morally complex as we all are? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> we have one big topic, I think, in the remaining time we have to, is really voting to talk about, we've got a, a, an election that's around the corner. Uh, this is a, a theme that is, is present in Lawrence's work. Um, I, it is very much part of uh, his understanding uh, that, that the freedom to vote in the North, which uh, obviously precedes the Voting Rights Act by a generation, has already helped to change the balance of electoral power. Uh, this, this panel is created three years before Adam Clayton Power Jr. Um, is elected although to Congress, although he's already um, advocating, he's already organizing as pastor of Abyssinian Church. Uh, here's a, a, a picture of him and don't buy where you can't work campaigns. Uh, Oscar de Priest had already been elected in 1928 from Chicago. So the vote matters. It is part of the democratic coalition that comes into existence precisely in the 1930s. So where are we now with Shell? Uh, Shelby, um, where are we? You know, the, the um, first photo that you show, showed, the Lawrence photo of uh, the people standing in the line to vote, it, I looked at it and it reminded me of a, so you all know about the Shelby County case. Um, we represented black voters in Shelby County, Alabama, who had challenged the um, method of electing their county leaders the town leaders, and, um, and we won in the, in the court below, but when we went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court decided that um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which was a key section of the act because it presented, prevented jurisdictions throughout the country, particularly in the South, from making changes to their voting system without getting um, approval from a federal authority, either the Department of Justice or a federal district judge. Uh, and um, this is a, a key part of the act because it allows, it, it, it ensured that voting discrimination would be stopped before it could happen. A, an assessment had to be made first of what the effect of the change would be on the minority population in the jurisdiction. And when the Supreme Court removed that protection, you know, it became a free-for-all, right? The, the Secretary of State of Texas said, we're free and clear now. Uh, the, the you know, Attorney General of Texas, you know, within hours of decision said, we're going to impose our voter ID law, the strictest voter ID law that we had successfully litigated and struck down, both under two provisions of the Voting Rights Act, under Section 5 and under Section 2. This is the, the voter ID law that we currently um, challenged and won in the, in the district court again, but it's on appeal and there'll be an appeal heard in a few weeks. That's the voter ID law that does not prevent our students, African-American students who attend Prairie View uh, College in, in Texas from using their student ID to vote, something they had been able to do for years. This new law no longer allows them to use it, but does allow you to use a concealed gun carry permit uh, as, as ID to vote. Now, Texas is a full employment state for civil rights lawyers. It's just, you know, you just, just every, <laughs> you could have an office down there. Um, so, so when I saw the picture that, that you showed, um, this picture, what it, what it made me think of was um, Morgan County, Georgia, where after the Supreme Court decided the Shelby case, um, the, the county leaders tried to, to close uh, all but two of their 28 polling places. 
and to place those two in a police station. And that's what I thought of when I saw the man standing there. Um, and we were able to you know, engage in other groups in activism to, to really stop it. But that's, it's like playing whack-a-mole. Because remember, it's not just you know, state voting laws like voter ID. It's every town council, it's every city council, it's every water district, it's every school board election. It's moving polling place, places, it's eliminating seats, it's going to at-large elections. Um, and so what the Supreme Court has done is really devastating and we have you know, our effort to try to move uh, Congress to amend the Voting Rights Act, but we also have you know, cases that are headed back to the Supreme Court, including this Texas voter ID law case that I was just talking about, as well as many others. And so we're in a critical moment. I mean, I say to people all the time, the two, the two markers, the two kind of um, maginot lines of citizenship for black people in this country is our engagement with the criminal justice system and our ability to vote and participate in the political process. We know whether we're full citizens you know, through those two things. And you know, if you can be just plucked off the street and beaten, killed, and you haven't done anything, shot in the back, running down the street, you are not a full citizen. And if you cannot participate fully in the political process, you're not a full citizen. So, so we're at a, we're, and those are the two issues that you know, are just kind of front and center for us. So we're at a critical moment. And what I've been saying to people that this is not a black moment in that you know, only black people should be concerned about it. We are in a scary moment in this democracy if we are willing to tolerate this level of, um, of, of imposition of second class citizenship on, on African Americans. So gotta wake up on the voting. I know we're all here in New York and everybody feels really comfortable, but you need to be calling and saying that that Voting Rights Act has to be amended. Because you know, section five of the Voting Rights Act co covers three boroughs in New York too, because of language minorities, you know? And so, and there've been cases in New York with the failure to provide Chinese language ballots in Chinatown and everything. So we, you know, New York is not immune from this and we need this protection. I think. I think one thing that's important for us to appreciate is that protecting the franchise is not something that can be relegated to uh, voting rights uh, litigators. Uh, this really is a challenge that is, has to be squarely borne by ordinary citizens. The point being here is Congress will not amend the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we, we, what we have right now is a Voting Rights Act that represents a vaccine that you can only use once you come down with the disease, right? In the sense of once your rights are violated, if you can find a lawyer, if you have the resources, you can then go to court and seek whatever relief there is to be found. Very difficult. As we've seen over the course of the 100 years of the NAACP's history, you need litigation, but you also need advocacy. You need people on the ground. And, the, and we have to think about this issue far beyond uh, the, the kind of racial and ethnic vocabulary that we're used to thinking about these issues. And, and I'll give you a simple analogy. When my mother was 16 years old, uh, she went off to college and she uh, demonstrated for civil rights as a, as a teenager. Uh, 50 years later, uh, she has multiple sclerosis. She can't march. She lives in Georgia. And she called me up one day and she said to me, you know, I'm worried about being able to vote. I need to find my passport. I need to find my ID. I'm concerned about this. The point being here is, is if race is an impediment, is it wrong? If your disability or your age is an impediment to voting, is it wrong? I think it's wrong in both instances. And that case has been made to the country. This, we cannot, uh, as, as talented a lawyer as, as Sherilyn Eiffel is, this cannot be delegated to the Legal Defense Fund. That is a responsibility we have to bear and we have to make. I, I, want, to say, I want to say one more thing because I do think that um, to the extent that many of us have taken on the role of observers of politics, which I think is how politicians just love us, you know, when we're just watching the ping pong match and we're, you know, we're talking about who's going to run for president and what did Boehner say and watch John Stewart and it's all very funny. Um, you know, we should be aware of the fact that that is our Congress. And, you know, and they represent us. And they have decided that we can't even get a, there's not, it's not as though there's not a bill in Congress to amend the Voting Rights Act. There is a bill to amend the Voting Rights Act. And that bill is co-sponsored even by a Republican, Jim Sensenbrenner. But they will not give us even a hearing on the bill. So while we're watching the ping pong game like it's a joke, we have no hearing on the bill, so we have no amendment to the Voting Rights Act. You don't have 
an attorney general confirmed because Loretta Lynch can't get a vote, right? And all of she this is while here. and all of this is while we're just kind of observing, right? But we're allowing it. We're allowing them to say, we're allowing the, the United States Senate to essentially abuse it, their advice and consent power by saying we're just not going to bring this to a vote, and you just won't you just won't have a leader at the very time when we have a pattern and practice finding of discrimination in Ferguson, and you now have the negotiations for how that police police department is going to be changed, whether it's going to be abolished. You have the call for a pattern and practice investigation in North Charleston. You have a civil rights division that needs more funds to investigate all these other police departments. You have this Voting Rights Act that can't get a hearing. All that's happening while we're watching the match and talking about 2016 and all that great stuff. So I would just say you know, to you, because I do have to do this little commercial, that Cornell is right. It takes ordinary people. It takes litigation. It takes advocacy. But for, you know, for heaven's sakes, this is not a joke. They are doing this on our time and, and with our rights. So I'm going to start to ask, asking some of the questions that the audience posed. But I want to give a plug to MoMA and the Schomburg, because it also takes our cultural institutions mm. um, to <laughs> engage and to be part of that process. So speaking of uh, 2016 and what we ought to be doing, someone asks, what should we as the audience listen for in the upcoming election period? And what might not be said that we should demand is answered? Say that again. <laughs> so what won't the politicians talk about unless we force the conversation? That's easy. Yeah. So last week, after the Walter Scott video was shown, I was on uh, Andrea Mitchell and I, and I said this and I mean it to this day, every person who believes that they are prepared to lead this country should be asked about that video, should be asked about the issue of police violence and what is the proper federal government response, how should the federal government deploy the billion dollars that they give to police jurisdictions all over this country. Um, I mean, they should be asked a series of questions. If we, if we go through these debates and we allow presidential candidates to purport to be talking about domestic policy, but not talk about the issue of the killing of uh, unarmed African Americans, you know, that we've now seen throughout this country and this culture of policing that has become so, that is so violent and so oppressive, then that, then that shame is on us. They will not on their own bring it up, I can assure you. We will have to force the issue. But if we want it, we should make that and the whole issue of mass incarceration front and center. Can I add a co colorful point on this? Um, we, were, we, we all were witness to the 2012 debate between Romney uh, and Obama at the town hall. And the question of uh, gun control came up in the wake of the Newtown massacre. Mm -hmm. yes. And essentially, the answer turned on divorce rates and broken homes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's not just that the topics are raised, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but we don't accept unacceptable answers. There you go. There you answered the question. <laughs> That's it. One other thing I would add is, is this. I mean, so if we think about the great migration as a migration toward opportunity uh, in a region with a profound, if you will, income inequality problem of the time, here we are in the middle of this new century. Uh, with a profound income inequality problem and a profound social mobility problem, meaning the children of the African-American middle class are not as well situated as their forebears. What is true of the African-American community in particular is also true of other communities. So, we, so what we have is social immobility related to race and zip code that crosses racial and ethnic lines and income inequality happening at the same moment. Asking our politicians, what policies do you have to speak to the ability of people to move up in terms of opportunity? Because here's the thing. In 2015, it is not a matter of leaving the South to go to the North. Where do you go? Point one. <laughs> uh, point two, the second issue would be the vote. Uh, it is profoundly ironic and hypocritical for our elected leaders and public servants to aspire to elected office via the vote and not provide a committee vote on protecting the right to vote. Yeah. We got to make that an issue. Yeah. This is a really great question. Um, so if you could escort one contemporary public 
persona, political figure, celebrity, etc. parenthetically, to see this exhibit, who would you choose Ooh. and why? <laughs> Every member of Congress. I was about to say, I have to be naughty. <laughs> I, I was going to say, me and John Boehner, we're going to walk through this exhibit very slowly and very carefully. And um, yeah, I, I really think that, um, and one at a time. <laughs> no, because they show off in front of each other, one at a time, to confront, to confront the power of the exhibit. There is power in art. And, um, and, it, and it has to be received, and it has to be explained also, um, I think. And, um, and I, you know, there, there has to be a moment in which you cannot look away. And, and might the audience serve as tour guides <laughs> for our members of Congress? So the same, same group of people. Same. No celebrities? No. You gonna let the celebrities off the hook? No, I mean, why do they, they can, they can see it some other time. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Who would, you, who would you score? You sound like you have somebody in mind. Uh, well, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, that's a, you're, you're ducking the question. I, I still have to fundraise. So, um, I, I'm going to keep mine to myself. Otherwise, I'd be dishonest. Okay. Oh, my God. So if you see me going through these slides it, or cards, it's because we've touched on it, so I apologize, uh, so you don't think that I'm just cherry picking. So someone asked, um, uh, going back to one of the cards I, I, I've, I've seen, that why didn't your organizations oppose the nomination of Clarence Thomas? We did, I'm sorry. Okay. With a, with a very fat report, we did. 1993, okay. was it? 91? 91. Mm -hmm. Cornell? Well, remember, Thurgood Marshall had led our organization, sure. so we were very clear. Sure. About <laughs> All right. Okay, here's another question. You have, I don't know that we need to spend much time on, on, on Clarence Thomas. Um, it is what it is, It right? is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> you have public awareness, but how do you get public willpower in today's society to actually see through wholesale reform of the criminal justice system when it is such a major U.S. institution? question about the scale of the problem and our individual responsibility. I just want to make sure I understand. The, the distinction scene. between public awareness, what we know, we are aware of the problem, and willpower. Mm -hmm. um, how do we close the gap mm -hmm. between those two in taking on this gigantic problem? I think many of the challenges that we are facing right now at, at this moment in American history, um, we have a, a media uh, that provides a certain surface level of awareness. But then where you have uh, media-driven, social media-driven engagement, direct action, demonstration, you create political will. And I think we've seen that. When, we, when you have a generation of young practitioners of democracy who energize the com country around criminal justice issues. I think the, where we are now is moving beyond that to creating a real reform agenda, focusing on political education, civic education, if you will, uh, the citizenship schools of, of yesteryear uh, for a digital generation uh, so that we create the political will not just in Congress or in state legislatures but among ourselves um, so that we're in these fights for the long haul, for the long term. So it's not a matter of a die-in today, a sit-in today, uh, and resignation tomorrow, but rather we fight these fights until the end. And so when we look at this exhibit, there's a, there's a, there's a persistence, a perseverance, a, a duration of will of you so to speak. We need that now. You need success. You know, I think the scale of, of the problem, whether it's the criminal justice system or the kind of anti-democratic governance systems that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer and, 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 and lead an organization that believes in big ideas and big vision, but you need moments of success. You have to take bite-sized pieces and be successful. Success builds on success, and it also convinces you that you can make change. Um, what, what I fear too often is that we end up sitting down and lamenting, and we, you know, because some of us are quite knowledgeable, you know, and so we know the scope of the, you know, we get the history, we know the scope of the problem, we know all the interstices, we know all the people, and we can have a glass of wine and talk about anything, but it's so big that it's hard to imagine, because you only can imagine it all falling at the same time, right, or, or being entrenched and existing. A great civil rights leader from Georgia 
um, Charles Sherrod, um, husband of Shirley Sherrod, mm -hmm. said, um, I love him, said, um, I was at a conference, I'm going to say this maybe 25 years ago, and he said, you know, he said, you know, racism is a shape shifter. It's a shape shifter, and you have to, you have to adjust yourself, you know, to the different ways. And that was such a uh, romantic way of thinking about it for me because it suggested an organism, you know, that you have to kind of be willing to accommodate yourself to. And within that movement, you find successes. And I, it's, it's something I believe in very strongly, that part of what disempowers our community is we don't show successes. I don't care if it's in a small town, you know, that you showed that you could create a governance system that was real, that you were able to disable one prison system that, what, you know, you have to begin to build on it because that's what gives us the confidence that we can keep pulling that thread or changing our shape to accommodate, you know, what the new challenge is. As long as we keep only talking about the problem in this size without taking a piece of it that we're going to dismantle, we will feel disempowered. We will feel like ants facing, you know, something that's too big for us to manage. And I think, you know, to, to, to be self-critical in terms of, um, you know, civil rights work, I think, we have, I think we have too often accepted not winning. And I really like to win. I want to win some stuff. That's I don't care what, you know, I don't care what the Supreme Court looks like. I don't care what else yeah, is happening. We've got we've to win some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is kind of um, a little bit of space we covered, but I think right at this space where you've just landed, um, puts Cornell's organization sort of in the spotlight. So the Spingarn Medal uh, was established very early on in the NAACP's history as a way to acknowledge um, leadership in the community and it could be expressed in, in politics or in art, in the literary realm. So people as varied as Paul Robeson, Marian Anderson, uh, whose famous protest song uh, at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 is featured in this show. Uh, as well as uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, most recently in 2013, who charged the organization with um, needing to have more accountability on the entertainment community uh, for not using its voice uh, in the way that he himself did and the way that he sees a moral obligation. So the question here is, what do you think about black entertainers that are respected and admired by young people saying that there really isn't a race problem. Discrimination is an older generation's inability to forgive the past. And Chris Rock, not too long ago, um, talked about the, you know, the only real racists left in America are old black men who talk about crackers, um, was his joke. Now, the reason I'm putting this in a space, because I do think there's a tension between everything that's happened since Trayvon Martin, and all of a sudden, you know, we are sort of focused on the ways in which there is an obvious conversation, but you know, there was 2010, this is not old right. history. And so I do think the question is relevant because it's still not clear what, what, this or, what your organization thinks about that historic commitment to honoring excellence in the arts with some relationship to a social justice community and the ways in which high profile entertainers today are not necessarily present in this moment. I would, I would simply say this. I mean, the NAACP has long recognized the relationship between uh, advocacy and art. Um, we, on a regular basis, reach out to entertainers to support our work in terms of voting. So if you look at, if you look at only a few years ago, when African Americans outvoted every ethnic group in the country for, first, for the first time, uh, the NAACP had a lot to do with that. And there were entertainers who stepped up and stepped out uh, in support of that. And so uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the, the ones that do the work and step into, uh, into the lineage, if you will, of Harry Belafonte uh, or Marian Anderson. Uh, we need to acknowledge that. We need to celebrate that. But we also have to say to those who do not do that, that you have a responsibility. But let's be clear about it. It's not just entertainers. It's people who believe that they can separate themselves from uh, the masses who feel the, the brunt of racism uh, in, in ways that, that are unconscionable and uncomfortable. So the point being here is, I, I don't believe that in, entertainers are unique in this sense, um, but I believe that they have a unique set of opportunities, perhaps a unique set of responsibilities. 
Um, and so we endeavor to do that on a regular basis. Yeah. Be clear. So in, in the spirit of Sherilyn's last uh, comment about successes, I think it is a point of um, small triumph and victory that John Legend is announcing this initiative called Free America. Uh, he's putting his reputation and social currency on the line and was prominent at the Oscars with Common and bringing attention to it. So something to build on. Yeah. So I want to do a house check because I obviously can't get through this entire stack. We are now at 805 and I'm not at home at the Schomburg Center. So I want to be respectful. Can I get a cue from someone whether we have five or ten to go? No one? No. Where is? Five, got it. I thought so. All right. All right. Recently, the New York Times had an article that said over one million blacks in the U.S. are not African Americans and identify themselves with their country of origin and not the United States. It also said they tended to be more middle class. Please comment. What effect, <laughs> what effect will this have on the African American population? I feel like this question's been asked over and over and over again, and the, and the great thing that people expect to happen never really happens, um, which is that um, you know, this huge separation will happen. You know what's, what's, what's been really astounding about you know, um, what has happened to African Americans, particularly in the middle class over the last 10 years is what has happened as a result of the financial crisis and the housing crisis, right. which immediately kicked 25% of black people in the middle class out of the middle class, um, pushing them into uh, either the process of foreclosure or foreclosure itself. This was a seismic, and, and it, it astounds me that it remains kind of unremarked on and is not a kind of top line news story the decimation that uh, has happened to the African-American middle class. What was revealed by it is that um, the African-American middle class in large measure was hanging on very tenuously. So it's like white knuckle middle class, um, not firm middle class. It's like, you know, miss two paychecks, not middle class anymore. Um, and so that was revealed by the crisis and then also shaken you know, um, by the crisis as well. So the idea that somehow your class status is going to allow you to describe yourself in some way that is not African American, that's going to mean you're kind of separated, I think has yet to be kind of borne out. Um, th the last thing I'll say is that you know, we are facing changing demographics, um, the, the strengthening and increase of the Latino population. The Latino population is also black in, in, in some measure. Um, and there are going to be complications about self-identity. We're also in a period of great um, uh, pressure over the desire to self-identify, just as a country. It has nothing to do with race. We're in a moment like that. So it would not surprise me that there is not a lot of tension around how people want to identify themselves. But the reality of race and class remain the same. And if we had more time tonight, you know, we, the one issue we haven't talked about that should be on the table, especially in New York, um, is the issue of housing segregation, which um, at the end of the day, if you want to talk about the unfinished business, is the unfinished business um, uh, you know, of your and my organization uh, and of the work of civil rights, and ultimately is the strand that pulls together mobility, economic stability, education. voting, education, it actually is the hub of everything. And so all the distinctions about, you know, whether I'm, uh, you know, African American from Africa or whether I'm Caribbean or whether I'm, while the housing segregation continues to be what it is, I don't think there's going to be a tremendous amount of currency in terms of separation that's going to come from that until we get our hands around this um, housing segregation issue, which is when we talk about scale of issue, is about as big as the issues involving the criminal justice system and some of the governance issues that I was talking about. Just one thing I'll note, in, in terms of immigration, the fact that you have so many um, uh, Americans of African descent who are not necessarily African American as we've narrowly defined it, says a whole lot about how we look at immigration reform in this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, we need to look at it in broader terms, ethnically speaking, without the presumptions that we often make in terms of the educational background and the, the means that people uh, come to this country with uh, or the 
what they have to give. So, so I, I think this is critically important. Secondly, thinking about uh, this exhibit, when we think about the Great Migration, we're really talking about uh, intranational immigration, if you will. And so that was an immigrant story with folks like uh, my people from South Carolina going to New York. Immigrants, if you will, within the country. So I think that does speak to where we are in terms of how we look at immigration now. Yeah. That's a really uh, a useful observation given that we are at the 50th anniversary of the Immigration Act of 1965. Um, I think we, we're in a little bit of un uncharted territory. I think the, um, the stakes of trying to build, rebuild a community is going to depend on common historical narratives. And I think that's one of the challenges that new immigrants, they're essentially saying, this isn't my story. And one of the things that mattered to the Caribbean immigrants that populate James Baldwin's Harlem was that they were quick to embrace this as their story. Uh, Arturo Schomburg, the founder of the Schomburg Collection, um, though deeply concerned about uh, Spanish imp imperialism in the Caribbean, in Cuba and Puerto Rico in particular, quickly identified as African American because he recognized that, that what the United States was doing to black people here was enough of a community to fight for black people elsewhere. And, and so in some ways, coming back to where we started with, with Lawrence's migration series, maybe the people who need to come see it are our young new immigrants um, to start a conversation about what it means in this country to have been black mm -hmm. and what it might mean to the future mm -hmm. of their blackness. I think That's we're going to stop there. <laughs> You've got to stop there. That was perfect. <laughs> Great. Thank you all very much. Cheryl and Eiffel, Cornell Brooks.